Hello and welcome to this latest session of the Astana Finance Days 2021. Uh, now we have a session hosted by the AIFC Court and the International Arbitration Centre at the AIFC. The AFC Court and IFC commenced operations on the 1st of January 2018. Since then, they have achieved considerable results and continue to implement a sustained enhancement programme to ensure that they provide the most up-to-date and user-friendly international standard commercial dispute resolution that is independent, impartial, incorruptible, and in the strictest accord with the rule of law. I'm not going to quote statistics on our results at this point of the session. I believe that our speakers will do so during the course of their uh, answers to questions. During this webinar, the participants will have an opportunity to hear firsthand from the AFC Court Chief Justice, Lord Mance, and from our IAC Chairman, Barbara Dome QC, on the activities and future plans of the Court and Arbitration Centre. Participants will also hear firsthand from one of our distinguished judges at the AFC Court, Justice Tom Montague-Smith QC, who has given judgments at the AFC Court at the Small Claims Court Division, and from an arbitrator from the IAC, Mr. Alexander Korobyenikov, who is an IAC arbitrator panel member and a partner at the law firm Bacon McKenzie. Uh, he has also given uh, awards via arbitration at the IAC. This webinar, I think, will provide unique insight, insight into how the Court and Arbitration Centre work in practice at the everyday practical level. Without further ado, if I may turn first to Lord Mance uh, with some questions, our Chief Justice at the AFC Court. Lord Mance, uh, what is the purpose of the AFC Court and how is it achieving its purpose? What is the purpose of any court? Um, the purpose of a court is to provide society with a secure background both to live and, in the case of commerce, to function. And um, in commerce, I think that is particularly important, that there should be confidence among businessmen, among investors, that the transactions they enter into will be given effect according to the intended understanding. And for that, you need an independent, an objective court with experienced judges, who um, in the course of their professional lives, in one way or another, have picked up an understanding of commercial realities as well as a firm grasp, of course, of the law. They must be not only independent, they must, of course, be personally impartial, incorruptible, and um, understand the principle of the rule of law, uh, at least as we understand it in the West and in, um, I think, a large part of the common law world, and I believe also in Kazakhstan. The justice which such a court aims to provide should be efficient, it should be quick, it should be reliable, and it should be accessible. Uh, it should be cost-effective, in other words. And, um, it should provide that not only in relation to the cases which come to the court, but um, this court, the Astana court, operates as a protective uh, and to a degree supervisory authority which ensures the reliability and operation, though only as a backstop, of the International Arbitration Centre, which is chaired so ably by Barbara Doman QC, from whom you're going to hear. And I say um, it operates only as a backstop because court involvement in arbitration is by definition limited, and so it should be. Parties who go to arbitration have agreed primarily that that is to be their method of dispute resolution. But um, arbitration, of course, needs to be enforced by courts, and just occasionally courts need to intervene to ensure um, justice when something has gone wrong, there may have been uh, an excess of jurisdiction or possibly even some failure of due process, but um, that is hopefully, of course, a rare matter. Our aim is to provide this sort of justice for business, of course, in the first instance in the Astana Financial Centre itself, but also uh, for anyone in Kazakhstan or in the region uh, or anywhere in the world who chooses to submit to the Astana International Financial Centre Court. 
And we hope that this last possibility will become increasingly apparent and increasingly used. Uh, we aim, in the first instance, therefore, to be the number one choice for commercial dispute resolution in Central Asia. And uh, we aim for recognition on the world scene as a significant common law court, among others, of course. Are we achieving this purpose? I believe we are. Um, 2021, 2021 is the fourth year of our operations. Um, we had, at the outset, set out a modest ambition of five case filings by this stage. We've achieved three times that amount, and we have, of course, achieved uh, many more arbitrations. I think um, some 40 arbitration awards and many, many mediations under our aegis um, in the hundreds, nearly 500. Um, and um, we hope that this progression will continue. We're confident it will. Uh, our judgments uh, have been uh, given um, by our judges, of whom there are in total nine, uh, and um, they are judges uh, of the small claims um, court uh, or judges of the um, main first instance court um, some of whom also serve in the Court of Appeal. Uh, and I have the privilege, as you've heard, to be the Chief Justice. We all come from uh, common law, uh, United Kingdom backgrounds. Um, that is not um, uh, by definition um, required, but I think this is established as a common law court. And it is important that um, we have, um, uh, for the credibility of the court, um, the experienced commercial judges um, with common law backgrounds that we do have. Uh, judgments are constitutionally uh, enforceable and have always been enforced um, through the Kazakh um, mechanisms. Uh, we work closely in collaboration with the Kazakh Supreme Court. Uh, I have just uh, agreed a transfer of cases memorandum with the Supreme Court, uh, which um, will, I believe, bring a, a number of cases to our court which um, are suitable for it. Um, we um, have been included in many, many business contracts, more than 5,000, including contracts of Chevron, Tengiz, um, Chevroil, and um, we are in discussions with other global corporations uh, uh, um, about the possibility uh, that they might um, use the court uh, which is something strongly encouraged by the um, Kazakh government. We um, uh, have operated throughout COVID without uh, problems. We have extremely efficient um, uh, IT and infrastructure, and we moved immediately to on online uh, operation, and there has been no disruption to the court uh, during the recent SAD period. Um, we have also given a number, a lot of webinars of this sort, um, one of the features of this court uh, is uh, outreach and our uh, able chief executive, Chris campbell Helt and registrar has um, particularly focused on that and ensured um, that we participate and make ourselves known. So I believe there's a bright future for the court and I uh, hope to see it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Lord Mertz. Um, I will, if I may ask you a second question. Um, and we're asked this all the time. I know we've discussed it before, but what is the AFC Court's jurisdiction and who is using it? Well, fundamentally, uh, the jurisdiction which is prescribed by the constitutional statute um, of 7th of December 2015 uh, is um, exclusive in relation to um, matters arising from the operations of the Astana International Financial Centre uh, itself. Um, that is disputes between um, participants in the centre, disputes relating to activities conducted in the centre and governing by, governed by the law of the centre, uh, and also um, uh, disputes about the interpretation of AIFC acts. That's a, a potentially important um, uh, provision. But I've already mentioned the fourth head, which is disputes transferred to the court by agreement of the parties. And um, that, as I've said, uh, will, I think, be increasingly significant um, as a result of choice of court clauses in commercial contracts and as a result of ad hoc agreements in particular cases. Um, it, it, you don't have to start a case in the local Kazakh courts. You can agree to come straight to the Astana International Financial Centre Court. Or if you have started a case in the local courts, uh, then uh, it can, by agreement, be transferred 
and the memorandum I've mentioned is in designed to encourage that. So this, this opt-in jurisdiction will, I think, be increasingly significant. Uh, we do not have jurisdiction, uh, obviously, over criminal or, or administrative uh, law matters um, or over pure tax matters. But, of course, questions of tax um, can arise in proceedings over which we do have jurisdiction. Um, and then we have to deal with them, just as any court has to deal sometimes with uh, uh, matters um, relating to um, uh, ancillary uh, matters uh, which are not within its direct jurisdiction um, or indeed in, in, uh, has to deal with foreign law sometimes, uh, we, we also. Um, so um, the court is already being used under all these heads um, by investors and business people um, and um, a, a considerable number of countries have um, already uh, used us. I think um, the um, uh, cases which we've had um, come from 12 regions within Kazakhstan and 14 countries, including the UK, China, Russia, India, Canada, Italy, Uzbekistan, Ukraine, Kyrgyzstan, Azerbaijan, Poland, Armenia, and Belarus. That's the parties. Thank you very much, Lord Mance. Uh, may I ask you, in your view, in a short form, if at all possible, what is special about the services of the AFC Court compared to perhaps some competitor financial centre common law courts? Well, we are, as I said, a, a specialist international common law court. Um, there are other uh, courts in the world, um, but um, we are the only one in Central Asia, and um, we intend to um, uh, focus um, primarily on that region and then um, expand. Um, we are 100% in independent from the local system. I think that's a, a very important feature which was deliberately chosen by the Kazakh government. Uh, and I think it was a wise choice. Um, the judges are also, uh, as I've indicated, um, uh, completely independent with um, huge expertise uh, and uh, reputations for impartiality and incorruptibility. And we have modern procedural rules which have been structured um, um, so that um, to conform with um, international best practice, they include, as I said, a small claims um, track, uh, a fast track procedure for small claims, that's claims to a value of up to $150,000. And we have um, top class um, IT and infrastructure. So I think um, um, we also benefit by um, a waiver of any administration fees for cases started before the beginning of uh, 2022, and the forthcoming fees thereafter will be very minimal and much less than the fees charged by competitor centres. Lord Mass, thank you very much indeed. If I may now move on to Justice Tom Montague-Smith QC uh, with regards to your experience, uh, Justice Montague-Smith QC, with regards to case hearings at the AFC Court. Um, I note that uh, you have, for everyone's benefit, you have so far given four judgments out of the 15 judgments at the AFC Court. Um, moving, the first question, what types of subject matter were there in your cases at the Small Claims Court? Yes, well, um, of, the, of the four cases that I've seen, three of them involved a contractual dispute, um, and, and they were all between the same parties and arising out of the same contract. Uh, that was a contract that happened to be uh, for the provision of geophysical investigations. And so one party had uh, agreed to carry out various surveys and then produce a report, and the other party had agreed to pay for it in stages. And so in the first case, uh, the claimant was claiming part of the fees due, which hadn't been paid. The second case, uh, the other party was claiming for the report itself. And in the third case, uh, there was a further claim for more money that was due after the report was provided for. So the court had to supervise the contract in effect all, all the way through. Um, and in that case, in those cases, the parties had agreed to the AIFC court's jurisdiction. And that is why uh, the case came to me. Um, the other case was different. It was an employment dispute. The employee had been dismissed and the dispute was about whether or not the dismissal was justified. Uh, and the reason why that was in the AIFC court uh, was that the employee was employed by an AIFC company. Um, and so that gave jurisdiction to the court. Uh, all of the claims were valued at less than 150,000 US dollars. And so they, that's why they came to the small claims track. 
Thank you very much, uh, Justice Thomas Hugh Smith. Um, can I ask you to comment, please, on how did the case management work and, and, and what distinguishes uh, the case management of the AFC court, perhaps from other interna inter international financial centre common law courts? Thank you. Yes. Well, as I say, that they were all within the small claims track. Um, and as a result, they were subject to a special procedure that applies to those sorts of claims. And that particular procedure is designed to be fast uh, and flexible. And I think one of the other features of this course is, is the accessibility um, and speed of response uh, by the registry in, in relation to the case management. Um, the small claims process also includes a separate procedure which, by which the parties can request a consultation. And that's a form of mediation which is supervised either by yourself, the registrar, or, or, or you can appoint someone to undertake that uh, mediation. So, so the procedure that I was dealing with is intended to be relatively informal um, and the idea is that it's supposed to be more accessible to inexperienced parties and, and the flexibility of it and the accessibility of it allowed the court, allowed me uh, to ask for more information quickly and get responses quickly when I needed it. So we have as, as the Chief Justice has already said, we have modern court rules which are intended to speed things up. So, for example, we don't need to have a hearing every single time we want to decide an issue of case management. We, we can just get those things done uh, quickly. Um, so just to give you a very brief explanation of what happened in my cases, um, in the first case, in fact, the defendant didn't respond and the claimant wanted a decision very quickly on paper. But I looked at the papers and decided that I needed a bit more information from them, uh, which was ultimately provided. So the, I think the claim was decided in approximately five weeks from start to finish. But two of those weeks were taken up in giving the defendant a chance to respond, which ultimately they did not do. About two and a half weeks were taken up with the claimant providing the further information that I needed to make the decision. Um, and I think in, in the end, uh, at the court's end, we took about three days in total to consider the claim uh, and make the decisions that we needed. And from my perspective, um, all, all of this was, of course, managed by the registrar, uh, yourself and, and your team. Uh, from my perspective, it all worked absolutely seamlessly. Um, importantly, from my perspective, we, we got I, I had good warning uh, of when I would be required. And so I was able to make sure that I had time in my diary. Um, and, and then um, you were able to communicate extremely efficiently with the parties to obtain the further information uh, and confirmations that we need. We needed, um, and the, as I say, the whole the whole process uh, took about five weeks, but but of our side about three days. The second case um, was from start to finish uh, took about three weeks, uh, and in that case, the parties both engaged um, and, and both confirmed quickly that they were happy for it to be decided without a hearing, um, which is what, what then happened. The, the fourth case, though, the third case result was resolved by agreement, but the, the, the final case was, required quite a bit more case management. Um, and, and in particular, one of the parties was not legally represented. And so it was important to make directions which was led to a speedy conclusion, but which made sure that firstly, I had all the information that I needed to make a decision but also that both of the parties, including the unrepresented party, was able to understand exactly what they needed to deal with at any hearings. So I, I issued a number of um, case management directions in that case. And in the end, the parties were able, they, they, they opted to, to um, participate in a consultation. And in fact, I think there were two. Um, I had no part of that, of course, that's all hidden away from the judges. So I don't hear what is said in that. Um, but eventually they were able to resolve that case. Um, in the end, it was extremely uh, efficient, in, in my view. Had we needed a hearing, we could have organised that by video link. Um, and we had some hearings lined up outside office hours to accommodate the parties, the judge, and to make sure that everything could be done um, quickly. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly modern way uh, of deciding cases, which balances needing to get to the end of the case as fast as possible, against, on the other hand, making sure that the judge has everything they need to decide the case and that all the parties have a full and proper chance uh, to, to, to explain what they say about the case. 
Thank you very much indeed. And may I ask you very briefly, what steps did you take to writing your judgments? I, I say this, one of our judges, uh, Justice Sir Rupert Jackson, has previously delivered a lecture via a webinar f f format on his approach to writing a common law judgments. But I wonder, in your practical experience of actual writing judgments at the AFC court, what, what was your experience and how did you approach this? I'm not sure I can do better than uh, Sir Rupert Jackson, who's, who's well known for the structure of his judgments. Um, but I think, uh, as I said, um, in the small claims division, which is where I sit, it's fundamentally important for us to make sure that we have all of the things that we need to decide the cases, because some of the parties who appear in front of us will not be terribly experienced at the kind of common law litigation that we're dealing with. And so accessibility is very important. It's important at all levels, but it's particularly important at the level that, I, that, that, that we sit at. Um, and so um, it was critical to, first of all, analyze the case and make sure that I had everything I needed and where I did not to make sure I issued directions which were very clear in identifying what were the gaps in the information that had been provided uh, and the way in which um, the, the evidence needed to be produced. After that, um, I went on to uh, analyze the case, identify what each of the issues were, set those out and then deal with what the parties said uh, about each, each issue uh, and come to a view uh, as to what the right answer was. Um, my judgments were in relatively simple cases. And so, as I say, I was in a position to produce my judgments relatively quickly in a case of, in the first case, I think within a couple of days, in the second case, uh, within three days. Um, and at all times, as I say, trying to balance the party's natural desire to get to a quick resolution of the case with making sure that everybody has had a fair chance uh, to, to deal with them. Thank you very much indeed, Justice Tom Montague Smith, um, QC. Um, in the interest of time, we will, we will move on, if I may, to the Arbitration Centre. Before I do, may I ask our Chief Justice, Lord Mance, if there's anything he would like to add uh, re with regards to the cases at the court, uh, before we move on to some questions for our, our Arbitration Centre. And if I may ask you to unmute yourself first, uh, Lord Mance. I think I'd like to thank and congratulate Tom Montague Smith um, uh, for his work on the small claims court. As I think he said, um, it's particularly important that that court should be accessible. It's designed to deal with um, people who don't have infinite resources and large numbers of lawyers to um, engage. And um, I believe um, he has demonstrated that um, we have succeeded, uh, he in particular, in um, fulfilling the function of that court. Thank you very much, Lord Mance. We will swiftly move on in the interest of time that we have today, if I may, to the Arbitration Centre. And uh, if I may start, please, with uh, uh, Alexander Korobienikov, uh, one of our distinguished IEC arbitrator panel members. Welcome, uh, Alexander. If we may jump straight into a similar line of questions so we can draw some analysis uh, between the court and the Arbitration Centre. So you were one of our first senior arbitrators to take on an arbitration case at the International Arbitration Centre. What types of subject matter uh, were you involved with as an arbitrator at the IAC? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, mm, uh, of course, uh, uh, arbitration proceedings are subject to much more, uh, much more strictly confidential rules than court proceedings. Therefore, take into account uh, these confidentiality concerns uh, I can say that uh, I have uh, I have considered uh, claims arising out from arrangements between uh, local parties, and uh, uh, these claims uh, relating to delays with uh, payments, lease issues, uh, and uh, liability for breaching contractual obligations arising out from uh, arising out from parties' actions, and uh, these claims uh, were based on Kazakhstani law provisions. Thank you very much, Alexander. Um, how did the IAC arbitration rules apply in your arbitration casework so far at the IAC? And if possible, what specific rules or any innovative rules uh, have you applied in your practice at the IAC? Uh, the, arbitration, uh, the arbitration proceedings uh, were based on AFC arbitration rules, and uh, uh, from uh, and from the beginning, uh, both parties um, uh, did did their did their best to comply with uh, with that rules as well as uh, 
uh, the arbitrator and uh, uh, international arbitration center staff as well. And uh, one of uh, the main features of that rules is that uh, they are providing the opportunity for parties to ask uh, the tribunal to issue uh, the interim relief uh, uh, award or order. And that's exactly what happened uh, in, in my proceedings, where one party asked the tribunal to issue such type of uh, interim, uh, interim award and uh, uh, the tribunal considered uh, this, uh, this request uh, partially, uh, and it was partially granted. Uh, and then uh, this request, uh, this uh, interim award was enforced via uh, uh, AFC court. And um, uh, I would like uh, to, uh, to highlight here that the whole procedure of the enforcement of such uh, interim award was very effective. Um, and uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it took approximately uh, two, three days since the date of the issuance of the interim award until we get the order from uh, AFC court. Therefore, that's, uh, that was very, very uh, time effective procedure and uh, it comes to uh, remarkable, uh, remarkable results of the enforcement of that, uh, of that interim award. Thank you, Alexander. How, how did case management work during the course of your arbitration work with the IAC? And, and what distinguishes, in your view, from a practical perspective, the IAC from other international arbitration centres? Um, here, I think that I will join uh, the previous speakers saying that um, the case, uh, one of the biggest challenges in uh, uh, case management in my, in my proceedings uh, were to instruct parties uh, in to, uh, to present their cases in proper way and uh, to provide all relevant evidence and uh, uh, proceed with uh, the settlement of, uh, of the dispute in most effective way. Therefore, similar to uh, honorable judges, I also issued uh, a number of uh, directions or instructions to parties uh, and uh, uh, try to guide them uh, uh, in line with uh, the procedural rules. Uh, however, ultimately, uh, it, uh, um, I think that we managed uh, uh, to proceed with that arbitration proceedings quite effectively. And it took, um, if I'm mistaken, around five months since the date of the commencement of the arbitration proceedings until we uh, until I issued the, arbit the arbitral award on the case. And um, uh, one of um, the biggest uh, advantage of uh, being the arbitrator uh, in uh, AFC arbitration proceedings is the significant support from a uh, international arbitration center staff and uh, uh, the register as well, as well and uh, first of all, Eucris, because um, uh, I, it was a remarkable support and uh, your staff was available 24, uh, 24/7, and uh, uh, any of my requests or questions were addressed. Um, Within within twenty within twenty four hours, therefore no delays and uh, not, uh, not nothing uh, nothing happened which uh, may uh, delay uh, the uh, the review of uh, of the case. Therefore, that was very smooth, very fast procedure, and uh, that was very comfortable for me. Uh, uh, to uh, to set uh, to be an arbitrator in that um, uh, in that arbitration proceedings. Thank you, Alexander. Um, similar to uh, the question we asked of the AFC court uh, previously, uh, what steps did you take to writing your arbitration award? And and I may add, if I may, that uh, Chairman Barbara Doming QC has previously given a webinar on drafting uh, arbitration awards. And so I ask you for your practical um, personal experience of this process, please. Yeah, again, I would say that uh, probably I, uh, I could not do that better than uh, uh, 
uh, than Barbara, but uh, 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 from the practical perspective, similar to what uh, judges uh, do, uh, arbitrators uh, need, first of all, need to summarize uh, the, his the, the history of the case and the parties' arguments. And after that, uh, uh, the, tribunal, uh, the, tribunal, the tribunal should provide its own reasoning uh, and assessment of uh, parties, uh, parties' position. And uh, like the main criteria of the quality of the arbitral work that the arbitral word is absolutely clear and understandable for parties. That's uh, uh, that's what parties uh, expect from uh, from the tribunal, and uh, um, I also expect that from uh, from arbitral tribunals when I act as a parties counsel. Therefore, one one of the main objective which I um, try to achieve while drafting the arbitral award in, uh, in AFC arbitration proceedings that make it absolutely clear for parties why uh, uh, the tribunal came to that, uh, to that conclusion and uh, uh, make sure that the tribunal cover all arguments and all issues which were, uh, which were presented by parties uh, in proper way and um, address them in the arbitral award. That's like the summary of uh, measures that uh, I uh, I took for uh, issues uh, the award, which as I as I understand uh, was in, uh, was enforced uh, by parties uh, voluntary. Therefore, that one was not compulsory enforcement proceedings, and that's another criteria. Uh, I think of. Uh, uh, good quality of the arbitral award. If parties do not challenge the award, uh, do not um, uh, do agree with uh, with that with that award and comply with the award voluntary, it means that they understand why the tribunal comes uh, comes to that uh, to that findings. Thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, moving on, if I may, um, it, it, I've already mentioned that you happen to be not only a a member of our distinguished IC arbitrator panel, but you are also a partner at the law firm International Law Firm Baker McKenzie. And I'd like to ask you one question, if I may, which relates perhaps to your, your work in that regard. And that is, um, as a lawyer, senior lawyer uh, advising clients on, on a daily basis, uh, how are your clients reacting to the op possibility of using the International Arbitration Centre? Uh, and to what extent are you now seeing at a practical everyday level the inclusion or the potential inclusion of the IAC in your clients' contracts? Uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, I'm, uh, in my practice, I'm mostly dealing with uh, arbitration, uh, international arbitration and litigation. And uh, uh, yeah, one of the most popular questions which I usually receive from my, from my clients, please advise on what uh, institution you would recommend for the settlement of, uh, of the dispute uh, uh, between, uh, uh, between clients and their counterparties in different, in different jurisdictions. Uh, and uh, one of the well, first uh, propo uh, first options which we propose for the client, that's uh, AFC International Arbitra uh, Arbitration Center or AFC Court, uh, because uh, the unique uh, uh, the unique uh, feature of uh, that of that institutions is that it's a good combination, I would say, of international practice, international uh, international approach. And uh, local rules and uh, uh, client and client oriented approach, uh, which uh, is highly, uh, which is widely used by uh, AFC uh, staff uh, and uh, uh, and re and register staff of uh, the court and uh, international international arbitration center. Indeed, one of uh, main. Well, uh, main criteria of uh, efficiency or uh, uh, or quality of any arbitration of any arbitration institutions are first of all time, then uh, costs, and then 
uh, effectiveness. I mean, whether, whether the relevant words may be, uh, may be enforced, ultimately enforced. And if we, if we consider uh, AFC, AFC arbitration center based on these main three criteria, they definitely meet them. Uh, that's uh, AFC uh, arbitration rules provides uh, for expedite procedure, emergency arbitrating, interim release uh, uh, that uh, or that's absolutely in line with uh, modern international international trends in in arbitration. Concern, concerning costs, uh, uh, again, uh, as as of today, there is no uh, there is no registration fee, and uh, as I said. Uh, a lot of services uh, uh, as a staff of uh, International Arbitration Center are providing for parties for free. Uh, and uh, AFC Arbitration Center can also provide parties uh, with, uh, on, uh, with opportunity to settle uh, their cases online, which also results in uh, cost, uh, cost efficiency. And ultimately, we are talking about enforcement uh, uh, I already mentioned uh, how fast uh, an interim award in one of my cases was uh, was enforced by AFC court, and uh, 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 that's um, and ultimately uh, that's uh, that's enforcement will be uh, will be conducted in line with uh, rules uh, uh, which applies to Kazakhstani uh, court judgments. Uh, therefore. Again, then uh, uh, from from that criteria, a AFC arbitration center mm -hmm. is very attractive for uh, for clients and for investors, especially if we are talking about disputes with uh, Kazakhstani state authorities or state-owned companies uh, uh, who are historically uh, quite reluctant to uh, uh, to agree to settle their disputes abroad. And uh, as uh, AFC Arbitration Center is located in uh, in Nur Sultan, uh, uh, these uh, uh, these counterparties are more flexible, are more uh, are more likely to agree uh, to set to settle this, uh, disputes here. And uh, I, I again uh, take into account confidentiality issues, but I could say that some of investors even consider. Uh, AFC arbitration center as a proper venue for the settlement of their investment disputes with uh, uh, with uh, with the states, and that's not only Kazakhstan. Uh, I think that's also one of uh, signs that AFC arbitration center already has a uh, quite good reputation among uh, among investors. Thank you very much indeed, Alexander, and uh, especially for your. Uh, your insight, your invaluable insight into the workings at a practical level of the IAC. I may now turn, if I, if I will, to our chairman of the IAC, Barbara Doman QC. Uh, chairman Doman, um, what is the purpose of the IAC and how so far is it achieving its purpose? Well, its purpose is obviously to do exactly what Alexander has described in relation to what people are looking for. Exactly as Lord Nant said, it gives investor confidence to have an international arbitration center where you know that the center is competent, independent, and offers excellent services and a superb list of arbitrators, very good rules, but perhaps very important from the point of view of users. Arbitration, as we know, is according to 90% of those uh, recently surveyed in this year's annual survey worldwide, the preferred form of dispute resolution, particularly in combination with the possibility of mediation, it becomes far and away uh, the most preferred method. And litigants who go to arbitration or to mediation know that they are very much in control of what happens. They have chosen the means of resolution. They can nominate arbitrators for appointment. They can choose the rules, our rules or unsuitable rules or other rules. And they have a great input on the speed of the procedure and how it works. And they can be sure 
in our center that there will be immediate enforcement of an award that has been obtained, be it an interim award, for example, a freezing order or a final award. So you know that litigation will not be in vain, it will actually be followed by enforcement. So as Lord Nance has already given statistics, I won't repeat them, but clearly the message had got through. You must never undersell your efforts. You obviously have to do still more uh, to spread the message, but we have had well over 500 cases and um, we have had very many, over 2,000 contracts, which now have our arbitration clause, and several of those contracts already being looked at uh, in relation to arbitration or mediation at our IAC. As Lord Mounts also mentioned, uh, we too have signed a transfer agreement with uh, His Excellency, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Kazakhstan. Clearly, this being arbitration, people can only uh, come to us if they agree to arbitrate, but it gives a very great choice now if you are already in the Kazakh court system, particularly if you have a commercial and transporter case, that uh, you can change course and come to us and have all the advantages that I have outlined that Alexander has described and that I can outline further. Again, it is very much worth mentioning that we had no disruption as a result of COVID. We have switched instantaneously uh, to online for hearings and for uh, all communications between the center and the parties and the parties uh, among each other. And it has worked beautifully. And I can say that this is generally true in the world. Of course, we much prefer to have in-person hearings where that is wanted and where economically that remains a good thing. But I foresee hybrid hearings and online hearings to continue for a long time. Thank you very much, Chairman Dermot. May I ask you for your personal perspective as uh, the IC Chairman on what specifically is special about our arbitration centre compared to other competitors? Well, our jurisdiction is, of course, uh, completely unlimited from the point of view of commercial disputes. It doesn't matter where in the world they arise. You can come to us. We are... Uh, fortunately attached to the AIFC Financial Center, and that gives us a special place in Central Asia. But you do not have to be within that center to come to us to arbitrate. Everybody can come. Uh, if they agree to arbitrate with us, they can do so. And our rules are most particularly flexible. Alexander has described them. Uh, the fact that we have summary determination, expedited procedures, emergency arbitrators, interim measures is a very important point and attracts people uh, to us and will do so more in the future, particularly once it has been understood that we have a choice of arbitrators, which means that you can choose people who know the legal system that applies to the law in which the dispute has arisen. So the applicable law can be dealt with by people who actually understand that law themselves. Equally languages, many, many languages are spoken, I don't have time to list them all, uh, by arbitrators who can be appointed. They have special technical expertise many of them in relation to construction, natural resources, financial services, and so on. So in other words, you can actually choose an expert in relation to the law, to the, to the language, and to the subject matter. This is most unusual and obviously can't be uh, offered by uh, state courts or courts in general. I have uh, mentioned the, the fact that you can choose different rules. I hope that people on the whole choose our rules because they're particularly advanced. 
but it absolutely doesn't stop anybody uh, amending rules procedurally by agreement uh, with the other side and the arbitral tribunal. And of course, I've already mentioned ancestral rules, which are uh, frequently preferred uh, by litigants because they're simply very familiar with them. We have really wonderful, uh, it's said world class, but actually uh, best, uh, I think, of, uh, in peer comparison, fiscal premises in Kazakhstan, and it would be delightful to be able to use them again much more. And the technical equipment is outstanding, as of course are our staff, who must be particularly thanked for having made the enterprise a, such a great success. Thank you very much, Chairman Doman. I move on to one further question, if I may, for you, Chairman Doman, and that is, um, I remember from the very outset of creating the court and the arbitration centre some years ago now, and there seemed to be a natural assumption from some people that if you create a common law court and an international arbitration centre, that they should compete, not cooperate, but compete. And we were very much together as a team of the view that cooperation would be very important to, to better satisfy the needs uh, the important needs of investors coming to us for dispute resolution. May I ask you to comment, please, from your personal view on, as our chairman at the IFC, on the interrelationship that we've achieved over the years between the AFC Court and Arbitration Centre, and to comment perhaps a little bit on the importance for investors of cooperation? Well, it's a wonderful relationship because it's built on mutual trust and the background of mutual trust and coming from the same legal system with the same value system. The court, as Lord Mans has explained, is really there to support arbitration. It wouldn't interfere, and it couldn't, because the applicable law wouldn't permit it generally. It would only interfere in circumstances, where, as Lord Mans has rightly said, there has been uh, the most unusual thing, we hope, continuing so, of an excess of jurisdiction or something has really gone wrong with a uh, fair process. Not something we expect, but it's important that litigants know that if something does go wrong, which is not to be expected, then there is this highly respected, impartial common law court, highly experienced in relation to how you deal with arbitration matters that will then consider the matter. The court, of course, is crucial from the point of view of enforcing the awards of uh, the arbitration centers of its tribunals, and that has already been mentioned, all our awards have been immediately enforced to the complete satisfaction of the parties. Thank you very much indeed, Chairman Doman. Um, I can see that we are getting quite short on time before we need to close this session for the uh, event. So uh, I will, if I may, outline myself on behalf of the Court and Arbitration Centre very briefly uh, where we're going with the Court and Arbitration Centre. And then I, if I may, I'll come back very briefly to Lord Manson, Chairman Doman, for any closing remarks they might wish to, to make. Um, for everyone's benefit on, on this session, I can assure the community, uh, both in, Kazakh in Kazakhstan, regionally and internationally, that we have uh, long-term enhancement plans for both the court and the arbitration centre. We're working very hard as a team uh, to implement those on a daily basis. We are looking towards the possibility of further expansion of services to make the user experience as, as more uh, accessible and friendly and helpful to parties as possible. Uh, we're looking to put towards potential expansion throughout the region of our services to a wider market uh, than we are currently working with. And we are looking, of course, to, to work towards further case numbers and building more stability and continuity into the everyday long-term workings of our court and arbitration centre. We have an excellent users committee at the court and arbitration centre that meets uh, regularly throughout the year. And we engage with the community in Kazakhstan regionally and internationally as often as we can. That said, we are open 24 seven for feedback from anyone who wishes to make it by simply sending an email or picking up the telephone or meeting us when it's, when it's health, health wise is permitted, uh, given the pandemic. Uh, and we will immediately or very quickly at least respond uh, with appropriate action uh, that our Chief Justice, the judges and our IC chairman and arbitrators believe is appropriate for our further growth. So thank you very much. May I offer um, uh, Lord Mance, uh, any final remarks you might wish to make before we close the session? 
No, uh, th th thank you um, uh, to all the participants for taking an interest in this subject. I think it's uh, extremely important um, for Kazakhstan and for the wider region, um, the development of um, a court and an arbitration centre uh, about which you've been um, listening. And uh, I hope um, that um, it will continue to receive the support. Uh, I was particularly interested in what um, was said by Alexander Korobienikov uh, uh, regarding investment disputes and arbitration, and uh, uh, that is exactly the sort of business uh, uh, where I think we can assist um, commerce and business, and um, I hope we, I'm sure we will do so. Thank you very much, Lord Mance. Uh, Chairman Doman, uh, would you like to make any final remarks? Yes, thank you. I really do, because I think it is it behoves one to thank those who have made what has been achieved so far possible and who will enable the great growth that we expect will happen. And that includes, of course, uh, the uh, Republic of Kazakhstan, and in particular the governor of the AIFC, who has been of very great support to us at all times, making it clear how independent we are and I want to thank all the arbitrators and mediators who have worked for our center, and some of whom have given their time for free at the beginning of our work. That's very important. And indeed, the center itself will not charge any fees until January next year. I have already mentioned that the staff of the center have been outstanding, as of course has been the chief executive officer and registrar without whom, quite frankly, I can't see how we would have done as well. It's not imaginable. So many thanks to Chris Campbellhold, uh, to Alexander, to all our colleagues, and we look forward to meeting in person and to have loads of arbitrations, including, in particular, investor state arbitrations, for which we are extremely well qualified to do, not least because on our panel are arbitrators who've done exactly that work uh, for very many years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman Doman. Thank you, Lord Mance. And thank you, Justice Tom Montague Smith QC. And thank you, Alexander Korobyanikov. Uh, that will now close. We've run out of time. Unfortunately, that will close this session of the Astana Finance Days. Thank you. And thank you to our participants for joining us. And we wish you a very happy rest of the weekend. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.